Welcome everyone to episode two of The Way, a Rudis Wrestling podcast with your host, Kerry Colat, and myself, Matt Dernlin. How you doing, Kerry? I'm doing good, Matt. How are you, buddy? Good, good. So uh, eager to, to jump into uh, chapter two of Switch. You know, last week we, uh, with our first episode, we kind of, you know, started talking about what, what uh, this podcast is going to be about and what we're trying to accomplish here. And, you know, we're, we're jumping in and, and trying to attack um, the book Switch. So right. I don't know if, care, care if you want to talk a little bit about the book or, or uh, yeah, recap you, kind of what we covered last week. Yeah, the, the, the book is written by Dan and Chip Heath. It's, it, the book is called Switch, and we kind of made a joke last time, but that's the title of the book, and we have the Switch and Wrestling, right? But um yeah, the, the book breaks down basically any, any kind of coach out there. And obviously if you're a manager or somebody in business, how to, how to lead a team. And if you're a coach, um, it's one of those things, right. You know, so being an athlete, it was easy for me. I, I, I had things in order. I, I scripted most of my life and most of my training, but then when you're, you know, when you're leading a, a group of, you know, 30, 40 guys, uh, not everybody thinks like you and you need help in all areas. And you're always trying to, to grow just like you did as an athlete. So this book, kind of touches on some basically, you know, kind of like human instinct, you know, to some extent. And, and the book starts out, chapter one's important because it kind of sets the tone of, of how people think. And, and basically in the book, he starts out that people are schizophrenic and they have two, two personalities. And one is the analytical side and one is the emotional side. And he refers to them as the writer, as the analytical side and, and the elephant as your emotional side, because it's the, the, the biggest and strongest part of you. And, and the idea is to get people in sync with those two. Um, if you're leading a team and you want to appeal to your team and you want to get all your guys to go in one direction, then you lay down goals that are that appeal to the rider and 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 get the emotional or the elephant um, all on the same path. And if they're on the same path, um, then guys are 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 typically going to go further or they're they're going to last longer, whatever it may be. And and so that's chapter one. Um, which is an important chapter. And if you are reading the book and you're following along, um, you got to, you got to remember that part. And now we're in the chapter two, Matt, right? We're, we're talking about um, bright spots and, and uh, the book is basically a breakdown of case studies for the most part. And uh, I really like chapter two. Um, I like uh, what I appeals to me is the simplicity of chapter two. And, and um, he goes through a few different things in there. Um, and, you know, one, we, we, kind of jumped into going into uh, after the uh, last show um in the bright spots one of them was a guy named jerry stern who was um he was contracted by united nations i believe um and i may be wrong i can't think right now um to go to vietnam because they had a a problem where where kids were dying at a young age due to malnutrition and you know he went over there with the idea to try to help fix this and um for the un and and if you read that section, he said when he got off the plane, um, he wasn't met with open arms. Uh, you know, I, I think the the people in charge didn't want to be uh, embarrassed by his findings. And they actually gave him about six months to figure out how to fix this problem. And if he couldn't do it six months, you know, he basically had to leave the country. And when you hit the, he hit the ground, you know, you look at it, there, there was a tremendous amount of problems. This is a, a country with which majority of the people are living in poverty. So you don't have the, the money to, to get adequate food that you'd like to get, you know, for your children. Uh, poor sewage, poor drinking water. Um, you know, uh, it, it was really just a mess. And when you look at it, it was probably, you know, billions and billions of dollars to fix the problem, which this guy did not have. Um, and he fixed the problem and he really fixed the problem within six months. Basically, within six months, he had put the plan in place to to help these kids and, and help these mothers. And uh, it's pretty impressive how he did it and very simple. And that's what I like about it. You know, and, you know, chapter two was almost like this is a crash course on how to run a program Yeah. Um, w when I read it. Because, you know, when you take over a program and, you know, what year is this for you at Campbell? Fifth. This is my fifth year. Fifth. Yeah. And so when, when, when you jump into a program, you know. When you're talking about building a program, you you can think on larger levels, right? You can think the the long term the long term goals of the program. Where do you want it to be? You right. Know? And I think I think um, 
um, with with uh, the gentleman that went to to Vietnam. He had a relatively short time to to solve a problem, and I think that's that's our role as coaches is we're trying to build a program, but in 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 the short term, you have a very small window to affect change in four years for for these guys. So, yeah, right. you know what what you would when you're looking at at your program as a whole and where you want it to be in ten years. That's not going to really help the guys that are that are already in the program when you took it over, or even as freshmen. You know, from your freshman to your senior year, that's a relatively short period of time in their life. So you have to be, um, you've got to be very specific and very dialed into your approach. And it, it, a lot of times I think we have the tendency to be like our athletes. We, we want to overthink things and we see the obvious long-term problems, but you don't have the luxury of of 10 years or getting this guy from when he was a, a bitty wrestler. This is what you've got in that moment is you can't really change a lot of the circumstances surrounding, you know. So when I, you know, when I took over Campbell, we were, I, the book that was given to me probably about two to three years before I actually took this job. And, um, I took over a program in dire, dire straits. Um, you know, and when you say in, in athletics, you know, the, the saying everybody's heard it, you win, you live, you lose, you die. And, um, so you do only have so much time. And, and one of the things Mike, I was concerned about is I had a, I had a future plan for the program, but none of that was going to happen without results, you know? So I had to put a short term plan together. You know, what could we accomplish on the type of guys that we had at the moment? Um, and then how are we going to, and recruiting is the biggest thing, right? That's your, that's your bloodline. That's everything. You know, the recruiting has got to be right. And what I was going to do to recruit, to fix that program, I wasn't going to get you know, top tier kids out of the gate, it was not going to happen. Um, you know, so we had a plan in, in place for recruiting that allowed us to win conference in, in, in three years and have a great NCAA tournament for, for the program. And, and now we're sitting good. We just took 10th at Midlands. And I, as I was saying before, I had a guy um, who was one of the original Campbell members that just sent me a, a text the other night saying, uh, I'll be honest, I doubted you and I didn't think it would work, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> And then, you know, then I could go knock on the door and get more results and it goes back. I mean, you know, more funds to do the things I needed, but, um, to, you know, continue to build the program. And, you know, now we've got a $2 million facility and a full staff and, and all those great things. But back when I thought back to the things I need to do, like this book comes back a lot for me because, you know, back to Jerry in Vietnam and in, you know, back to the bright spots of what the book is talking about. So this guy had this tremendous problem. And he, he wasn't going to have billions of dollars to solve it. And he did the most simple thing you could do. And he said, let's go out in the villages and find the healthy kids. And here's this guy, you know, he's probably got multiple PhDs or whatever it is. And, and anybody else, their rider, you know, back to the rider, the analytical side, the analytical person would see all these tremendous problems and start trying to solve them all. And he said, let's go find uh, the, the moms in the village who have the healthiest kids and let's mimic what they're doing. And I just I, I found that, you know, it's simple. It's brilliant. And when you go back to wrestling, when, you know, that's I, I look at my career. I wasn't I didn't know I was doing but I, that's what I was doing. I was copying. You know, if you want to call it being a good copycat or mimicking people like you don't need to reinvent the wheel, you know, and you can't be so stubborn that you know you can't look at your opponents and say okay wh what what are they doing and why are they beating us you know what what are they doing you know and and can we take any pieces of that and does it fit us you know and i I've, I've run into a lot of stubborn people and i'm sure you have because they're not willing to do that right they got too much pride and and i had no pride when it came to to trying to figure out a way to win and if that meant you know doing the workout that you do or picking up a movie you know, i had no problem going to where you train I had no problem doing that stuff. And, and I think Jerry in this, in his book, mimicking what the poor woman was doing who had no money and had healthy kids. Um, and then taking that information and giving it to the rest of the country. He didn't have any, uh, ego and the fact that I'm this brilliant guy and I'm going to solve it by following, uh, the, the Vietnam, Vietnam woman who's, who's, you know, living in poverty and has healthy kids. I mean, he did what he needed to do. And, and I just find it brilliant how he finished it. No, and I th I think a, a lot of times also when you're you've got to 
you've got to scale your expectations to your program, right? Yeah. I think a, a lot of people, and and I had this temptation when when I left Penn State, and you know, my last year at Penn State was the 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 first year they they won their national title, you know, and then I took over at Clarion, and you know. I went in and tried to, I made, I made the classic mistake as a young head coach. I tried to introduce everything that Penn state was doing yeah. to, to the program at Clarion, which wasn't realistic. And that was, that was a recipe for failure. So, and I, I figured that fortunately I, I figured that out very quickly and I'm like, Hey, I can't just do a blanket, you know, a blanket statement and introduce a blanket philosophy and culture into this program that that really had very little similarities to Penn State. So what I had to do you didn't, was you I didn't quickly say had to you didn't sk- you didn't you didn't say to your team we're going to win the national championship in your first day. <laughs> <laughs> right? you know, I, I mean that's a classic. Right? That's the classic mistake, right? A big ego guys, and they feel like they have to say, I, I you know, and um, I never said that to my guys because the truth is you have to the guy. Uh, you know, th- these college guys aren't aren't idiots. And so what you have to do is you have to keep laying down the foundation and and recruits aren't idiots. You got to keep taking one step at a time, you know, and and, um, you know, I, we're in that place now where my guys are starting to see it. Hey, we could win a national title. We keep growing, you know, and I use other programs who are like the uh, us at one point where they're at. Hey, Virginia Tech was I, I tell people maybe worse than Campbell, you know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I mean, do you remember how bad that program was? Yeah, I mean that was you got excited when you you saw Virginia Tech on the on the schedule, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like, hey, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, it, but you have to get the steps right. You got to do the steps first and in um, lay the correct foundation and and script the moves. Um, you know what you're going to do, what you're going to accomplish first, and and do those things. And and um, but yeah, back to what you were saying. I'm sorry. Go back to you. Yeah. So I think I think one you have to be a one realistic about the the program you're in and what success means to that program, right? And that that's the most difficult thing for highly competitive people is to scale their expectations because you think you think you're compromising or nego- you're trying to negotiate success. It's like, right. no, I should be like the only way, you know, the only thing I know how to do is talk about winning the national title or, you know, um talking about winning a team championship. Well, when in the reality of a lot of programs, like, Hey, I need success for me is actually getting guys to the national tournament. So how do I make that happen? Because that's the first step along the way. I can't, I can't develop national champs if I don't have guys in the tournament. So getting guys to the tournament and then learning how to navigate the tournament and then learning how to success to have success. It's, it's a process. It's very sequential. And, you know, I think the one thing that that's in short supply, not only in wrestling and coaching in, in, in any avenue of life, like patience is not a strong attribute of a lot of highly competitive people. Right. And I think that's where, um, you know, the, the beauty of what this chapter talked about is like, Hey, I, I kind of want to say it's like moral victories and maybe that's not the white, the, the right way to characterize it, but it's like showing, you know, short term success because people need to find success. They, right. I mean, that's, that's, that's important. Like, well, this is guys, why, this is why every freshman, how many freshmen, you know, who make the, the jump to D one, right. You lose a bunch of guys because they don't see the carrot for the longest time. Right. It's, it's, right. And, and so that's what you got to get them to focus on it, of the small gains. I mean, I, I'll give you an example. I have a freshman right now who's struggling. He's he's struggling. His his record is is not that he's he's five and seven as a true freshman. Um, you know, he wasn't coming in as a national champion. He was a part time wrestler um, who made the transfer his senior year to full time wrestling, and he's he's absolutely struggling with a five and seven record. And when I went back and I t- pulled the 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 last year's NCA championships and I took all the all Americans and then I went to wrestlingstat.com and, and I pulled their results as a freshman. Then he can, he like his eyes lit up because he's not far off. You know, it's, it's crazy, you know, and, and that's where you gotta, you, you know, you have to focus on growing and you gotta, and you said the key word is victories. And as a coach 
or, or, or somebody leading a program, you have to find ways to celebrate those small victories, right? And let them to make sure they see the growth is there. Because a lot of times we get caught up in big picture stuff and you forget all the small things that add up to that um, and lead up to that. And, and that's important. And you got to script it out for them. And I think one of the analogies that was brought up in, in chapter two here was, was the, the child that brought her grade card home. She had an A, three Bs, and one F. And yeah. if, if you pose that question to, to probably 10 out of 10 people, like how would you address this situation? What, what would be the first thing that you would address to your child if they came home with an A, three Bs, and an F? most people would jump right to the F. Like, right. why are you failing? Why aren't you having success? Instead of, to your point, when you look at a lot of freshmen, if a freshman in college can have a 500 record, that's that's pretty good. I mean, that's not part, I mean, that's, that's typically where m- the majority of freshmen come in. If they're 500 or in, or in and around 500, their first season, it's like, that's a, that's a really positive building block that you can springboard from into your, into your sophomore year, whether, but a lot of coaches and a lot of athletes, they just focus on the negative side of the ledger. They're like, yeah, I'm only five, I'm I'm only mediocre. And you, you have to explain to them, no, this isn't, this isn't mediocrity. You're actually very successful. (coughs) You just, you know, in relation to how this process is going to work. And so, you know, I think that's really, really important to constantly introduce the positive side of things because the athlete just that's by our nature. When we're, when we're competitive people, we're also very critical of our performance. So we always want to focus on the negative things because, you know, honestly, you know, you could probably ask any successful person out there like, Hey, tell me about the national title you you won. I'm like, I don't, I don't really remember it that much because I expected to accomplish that thing, but I can tell you about the four losses I had on the year and I can yeah. break that match down, you know, in great detail. I've got, so seven. I think it's just, I can remember them. I remember. All right. Of them. <laughs> yeah. And you can probably, you probably know the, the, know the name, the singlet and the event that, that those losses happened. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, well, back back to the we you know back on the 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 title of the chapter is bright spot. So in my program, when I have a kid who comes in and he's frustrated like that, um, I always use three guys in my program, and and um, Quentin Perez, my my sixty five pounder, as a as a true freshman was five and twenty, right? Five wins, Matt, and and the five wins were to non Division one wrestlers. So you can't even you, really in the end you can't even count those wins, right? So he's like zero oh, and twenty. And, um, and now he, he, the next year he, he got himself in the rankings. He, um, took himself to the NCAA tournament by winning SOCON. And so he's a bright spot, right? He's somebody that, okay, what did he do? You know, and I can tell you what Quentin did was every day when I opened the door, he was there. He's a guy that you just have to kind of tweak, you know, he's going to be running, you know, he's going to be doing the conditioning, you know, he's going to be lifting, you know, he's going to be drilling. And, and so the work was not a problem with him and it was just fixing the technique. And then, you know, Josh Heil, who's, who was uh, was redshirting last year? His true freshman year was o o and eleven or o and thirteen at the start of the year, and his you know his brother's a two time defending national champ, so he's got this standard that he's wrestling up against anyway, and um you know and then he at, by the end of the year he won like fifteen straight matches or thirteen straight matches, won the SoCon with the Nationals, and then my heavyweight um, Jerry Hino, I was just looking at his record, and he was I think he was um, thirteen and fifteen. You know, didn't even have a winning record. Now he's one of the top heavyweights in the country. And, you know, and so, what, you know, obviously we make those guys our captains and, you know, we tell our, our other guys and our true freshmen coming in, hey, you can't go wrong doing what these guys do. You know, duplicate what they do, you know, mimic it as much as you can and then add your own stuff to it um, in terms of the work and the extra time and the extra drills and, and, and then the technical side. So, you know, that's that's back to what the book is talking about is just, Focus on the bright spots, um, mimic it, copy it, and and you know grow from it. And I I think you know to your point there, I think it's also important as coaches is to pull appropriate examples for the appropriate kid. By that I mean you know if 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 you're you know talking to a kid that was maybe not a high level not a high level recruit. 
but he has high levels of expectations. It's hard to say, you know, like when I was at Penn State, you know, for one of those kids, it wasn't like this, the, the number one recruit in the country that was, um, and you, you start using examples of David Taylor, all of a sudden, like, like you were saying earlier, these kids are smart. Yeah. In their, in their mind, they're like, uh, Hey coach, I'm not David Taylor. I'm never going to be David Taylor, you know? So that's to, to give him an example of the struggles David Taylor went through. He's not going to completely identify with, but to your point, like with, with all your wrestlers, you know, there's appropriate examples that you can use that are, are very consistent with other guys' struggles on your team. Like yeah. I had a guy at Binghamton who was, when I got there, he was in his second year. He was coming off, he wrestled his first year at 197. He was like one, one in 20. And three years later, he was ranked in the top 15 and was our first conference champion in the EIWA. Right. And so a lot of guys could identify with that. They're like, Hey, here's this guy that was never a state champ. You know, that was only a state placer who won one match his freshman year. And four years later, he's ranked in the top 15 and wins a, a conference title. And so in that regard, they're like, Oh, that's attainable. I can do that. I'm as good as that guy. Right. So it's, right. it's, it's, being cognizant of pulling out the right analogies to, to, to use for your other athletes that make it tangible for them to believe that success is possible. And as and I think that's the, the, the beauty of the, the, the bright spots is they really simplified things. Right. And back to, you know, if you're listening to this, once you start to achieve success in, in, in an art sport, let's just say it, it's, 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 it's winning, right? You, you can't deny it. There's a win and loss co column. And once you start winning at, at the college level, your recruiting changes and then your standard changes. Maybe you're a freshman five years from when you got here. I might be sitting here another five years from now saying that, you know, the, the average freshman on my program goes, you know, I, I don't know, 20 and five instead of five and 20, you know, to start out in, in um, and then your standard is different, but your kids should be different by then. And, and I think that's where coaches get frustrated. Again, we go back to make sure you use the right comparisons and the right people. Um, but understand as your program starts to become more successful, you're the kids you attract and, and the expectations they put upon themselves changes. That's the biggest thing because your program starts to change your kids as we, people always like to use the term culture. And as it changes, um, you know, they're, they're better. They're, they're more resilient. They can handle more. I feel like now I know, well, I know now for a fact that my freshman, that we have now in terms of training. When I got there, I had a certain format for training and it was, uh, I didn't work out anybody over an hour for the first, you know, six, you know, first, first half of the year. Um, because I didn't feel like they could handle it. And if I tried to keep guys in there hour and a half, two hours, they would just mentally break down. And then over time we've gotten that, that level of intensity up and the level of training up and my freshmen coming in now know they don't know any different and the ones who stick it out are, are much stronger for it. And, and that's just normal growth, you know, and, and we've used those kids who started with the program and have changed their careers you know, as that. I think an, another part, do you remember the part when there, there was a part, actually, I had made a note as I was going through the chapter and, and there was a part uh, uh, about video and, uh, and, and I do this with my guys and I did it as an athlete. And I don't know if you did, I always like to say, but I never watched matches where I got beat. Like I didn't sit down and say, let me see that match. And, you know, and it, maybe if it was, uh, you know, a four, three match and I lost in one position, but half the time, more than half the time, like I knew exactly why I lost the bout before I shook hands and walked off. And I think most, most high level athletes are like that, but, but I don't have my guys sit there and watch matches of when they perform their worst. If anything, I have them watch the matches where they perform their best um, just because it's such a good visual. Like, okay, you performed your best. You were moving, you know, just right. Your fakes were, were up. Your level change was great. Your, you know, you, your technique and your poise in the entire seven minute go was perfect. So what, would, what did you do before that match what, and duplicate it? You know, that's what I'm always striving to do is get them to du duplicate those great performances and then those great performances get even better. Um, but I, I hate when I hear people let me watch, go back and watch every match that, 
you know, you've lost and, and pick it. I just, I never seen a point in it. And I, I wouldn't do it to my athlete and I didn't do it to myself. I don't know how you were with that. No, I mean, I, I, I think when you, when you, when you're in the heat of battle, like you are right now, you're halfway through the season. It's really hard to change something that's, that's broken. Yeah. Halfway across the river. Right. So instead of saying, this is what you're not doing to your point, number one, kids are already saying, yeah, coach, I already know that I'm, I was the one out there. I know why, I know why that didn't work. <laughs> right. Um, but instead of focus on, focusing on the negative there, it's like, Hey, this is a positive thing. Let's do more of that because you've, you've shown me you're capable of doing it and doing it very well. So what do we have to do? What, what things do we have to focus on to allow you to hit that more and more frequently as opposed yeah. to let's change this thing that realistically isn't fixable in the next two months, you know, for us to fix it, may, maybe in April, we can break out the tape and like, Hey, let's really break down why, why we're struggling in this area or why we're not able to execute this, this technique in this situation. Let's, let's, let's focus on that from, from April to <coughs> September as opposed to trying to fix it from January until the middle of March. Right. Instead, Hey, this is what we're doing really, really good. What can we, what are some easy fixes to add to that, to allow you to hit this, hit this technique or, or hit this move more frequently to have a, maybe a higher rate of success or a greater likelihood of success. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's, that's exactly how I agree. Like I said, when I come back to video, that's, I want to be on point. I want my guys always seeing themselves at their best. You know, it doesn't mean as a coach now, there's some days you go and kick somebody in the butt. That's for sure. You got to watch something, but for the most part, I want them firing on all cylinders mentally and, and physically at all times. And and so I want to focus on the, the best parts of them, you know, for most of the season, but you know, and I think that's, that's, you know, the one thing sometimes what's easy to overlook as a coach is how powerful our words are, right. And how long that they can stick with someone. So, you know, you have to introduce negative things to, to get improvement, but also kids need reinforced over and over and over again. Like, it's the old business analogy, kiss, right? Keep it simple, stupid. It's, yeah. the, it's the same way in coaching. A lot of a lot of times we over overcomplicate things as opposed to just, hey, keep it simple. Like, hey, you're doing this really good. Like, right. I believe, I believe in this. I believe in you. You can do this. And then you know, you say that ten or 10, twenty times, and then you introduce something like, hey, maybe we can tweak this. Not, not like a big overarching change, but a minor tweak. And all of a sudden you've been reinforcing all these positive things that when you actually introduce a certain element of change, it seems a lot more feasible and a lot more attainable because it's, it's, you haven't been saying harping on that over and over and over again, because when you, when you do that, it almost seems like you're creating even more of a barrier for your athlete to overcome as yeah. opposed to minimizing yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. Well, we're at we're at thirty minutes, man. And I'm yeah, I stuff. think that's How about you. I think <laughs> that that is uh, good for for today. It's almost like it seems like this whenever uh, when I'm talking to Ben about things, it's like there's there's so there's there's so many great gems just yeah. in one chapter that that we I don't think we even got to half of them. But hopefully, we were able to to touch on some things, spark spark some thoughts or spark some discussions. Yeah. Um, All right, man. You want me to sign it off or you want to sign it off? Yeah, go ahead and sign it off. All right. All right. All right. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the episode two of, of the way. Um, again, we're reading the book switch and just Matt Derlin and I are, are breaking it down chapter by chapter and just seeing how we can relate it to, to what we do out there, man, whether it's coaching and in, um, or, or just, just being a parent or whoever it is. But um, anyway, hope you enjoyed it. Um, the book is by Dan and Chip Heath. If you want to pick it up and, and follow along, be my guest and, and um, have a good night. All right, Carrie, take care. All right. Bye.